hello everyone uh, welcome to the public debriefing of our first barrack plenary meeting in 2021 my name is michel van bellingen i'm the barrack chair of uh, this year and it is a, a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this uh, webinar on the barrack public debrief following our uh, first plenary of the year which was held last week uh, as you know, we switched to a virtual debriefing session since the, the pandemic last year, so for the fourth time. But we have uh, over uh, 107 registered participants today, which is an absolute record in terms of audience in these debriefing sessions. 2020 was a pivotal year for uh, Barrack, following its 10th uh, anniversary celebration in 2019, Barrack's activities in 2020 were uh, pre predominantly focused on meeting its obligations under the European Electronic Communication Codes. And uh, as a result, Barrack delivered a set of 11 guidelines across a broad range of thematic uh, areas. This to achieve a consistent uh, implementation of the uh, regulatory framework. But in 2021, much of our work will shift from providing guidelines towards assessing future technological and market developments related to end users provisions or digital uh, ecosystem. So uh, it's, it's great that we can already present you uh, with the very first results uh, today. And in, in addition to that, we will also work intensively on several topics related to the work uh, of the uh, European Commission and the European is, is doing quite a lot. Roaming regulation, broadband cost reduction directive, access recommendation, 5G communications, NIS2 directive, but also new initiatives like the Digital Markets Act and uh, sustainability. So with uh, regards to the, the review of the roaming regulation, I'd like to say that Barrack is welcoming the review and the continuation of the regulation. We agree uh, with the principles set out, which are destined to allow end users to have a more qualitative and informed uh, use of their mobile phone in the roaming. This being said, we are currently assessing EC's proposal in more detail in order to provide our inputs uh, on detail and practical uh, aspects. So those of you who have been following our public debriefing for a while might notice a, a change in the organization as we are now having this on Wednesday after the, the plenary, whereas we published the adopted uh, Barrack document already on Tuesday. So this allows you to see and scan the documents already before the direct interaction with us and the co-chairs. So with that, we can now switch to the presentation and show it on the screen um, to you. And next slide, please. Thank you very much. So during our uh, plenary meeting last week, uh, Berg has adopted over 10 documents of which we will present you the most relevant documents today. Uh, two reports for public consultation, one on the third party payment charges on mobile phone and one on indicators regarding OTT services. Two opinions as well, one on DMA and one on BCRD. And one set of guidelines on geographical surveys of networks uh, deployment. And next slide, please. So on the top of the items we will present to you today, there are two documents that we have already adapted, but they will not be discussed today uh, in great length. We have the Barrack International Roaming Benchmark Report. So you are uh, very familiar with this uh, report, I guess. And a Barrack report summarizing conclusions from the internal workshop on sustainability. So this report provides an, an overview of the discussions we had in, in Berwick with some other associations and experts in the field of sustainability and electronic communication services. As you know, uh, Berwick is in the process of upskilling and growing 
is its knowledge in this domain. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So here you find the dates of the public consultation for the documents that will be present, uh, presented later on. This shows you a summary of uh, the closing dates for the, the public consultation. And I'm also happy to be joined by the lead authors of the documents, the co-chairs of various working groups that were uh, involved in the documents we published. And I'm also joined today by our incoming chair, my estimated colleague, Anne-Marie Sibbs from ACM, who will succeed me next year as the BEREC chair. At the end of uh, the meeting, Anne-Marie will tell you more about the stakeholder forum coming up in two weeks' time, which will focus on some specific topics. So, Joe, let me now uh, explain to you how to interact and uh, ask questions. So, some of you have already submitted questions ahead of this event, and we will address these questions during, uh, first during the two dedicated Q&A uh, slots foreseen in the, in the agenda. But if you wish to add questions in relation to the presentation or in relation to a work, don't hesitate, you can do so in the chat box. So, uh, let's start with the first presentations from our co-chairs of the working group dealing with uh, statistics and indicator. Begonia and Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to present the VEREC guidelines on geographical service of network deployments. Uh, as you know, these guidelines deal with the consistent implementation of paragraphs 2, 3 and 4 of Article 22 in the Code. The paragraphs describe optional policies that the Member States can undertake to create a more transparent environment for investment in THCN. This is by the release of public information. In particular, authorities may designate areas. This is, identi identify the boundaries of areas with no VHCN or no networks offering at least 100 megabit per second download speed. And also, authorities may, if they wish, subsequently invite public and private agents to declare their intentions to, in to invest in VHCN within these areas. These guidelines provide a common understanding of the paragraphs in the code, elaborate on the procedures to carry out the publications of invitations, and also um, provide the criteria to designate areas. The draft for these guidelines was on public consultation in October and November. We received six contributions, which the working group is really thankful for, the feedback we received has certainly improved the document. Okay, so most of these contributions showed a broad agreement with the draft guidelines. For example, on the distinction between Article 22 proceedings and state aid proceedings, on the notion that designated areas should be stable on time, and we are happy about this. And one important aspect that has changed as a result of the public consultation responses refers to the periods uh, considered to respond to the invitations to, uh, um, to, to declare intentions to invest. These periods have now increased. For example, the response to the public consultation for these invitations has gone from 30 days to 60 days. And there is also a two-week period exclusion between the publication of designated areas and the first invitation. And with this, I finish and I give the floor to my colleague Julia, who will be presenting the draft report on harmonized definitions for indicators regarding OTT services relevant to the electronic communication markets. Thank you, Begonia. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As my colleague has already mentioned, um, I'm going to present today uh, the work done by BEREC with respect to harmonized definitions for indicators for OTT services. Uh, the objective of the report is to identify and define relevant indicators for NRAs, which are useful for performing the regulatory tasks and also proportionate to collect. Uh, the, the focus of the report is twofold. 
um, mainly on um, number independent interpersonal communication services on the one hand and also on the video streaming services on the other hand. Uh, it is not noteworthy that this report builds on extensive stakeholder engagement throughout uh, 2019 and 2020 and the stakeholders have expressed uh, willingness to further get involved in discussions with BEREC in that respect. Um, we have put here the main coordinates of the public uh, consultation. So the report is going for public consultation for a period of five weeks. As usual, we have a dedicated email address, which is stated here where you can send your contributions. And we would also like to draw the attention on the fact that concerning particular indicators, um, data traffic for video streaming services, at the end of section three of the report, there are four particular questions to which we are um, looking for particular answers from you. And this is uh, highly encouraged to, to, to provide answers to, to these particular questions. Um, this would be all from my side. And I will now uh, pass the floor to Jorge and Chiara, uh, who will be presenting on the DMA related issues on which Berek has been working. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia. So we are to present you now uh, our work on the DMA. Um, that is essentially, you, we have published two documents. The first one you can see in this in the screen is a kind of of summary of the views we present with more detail in the public consultation. And so you will not find anything that is not in the document for the public consultation. So our story is a kind of summary uh, extracting the the main points and main issues and will be used for the interaction with different. Uh, stakeholders, institutions, etc. And the second document is the, the one subject to public consultation till 4th of May. We have left you um, a bit more time than usual because we know that this is a, a complex issue and it develops on different issues for, for the DMA. So we have open to public consultation <laughs> in line of what we are saying in the document about the constant di dialogue with the stakeholders and taking into account all views, etc., because we want to enrich our, our views. So do not hesitate on sending any feedback. On the contrary, we encourage you to send in on a feedback if you disagree with anything, if you agree, if you have additional proposals. We know that there are issues that need more uh, development. For example, we are starting to work uh, deeper on, on NICS and that interplay overlapping uh, between the DMA and, and, the, and the code. So uh, in, in the Berek website, you have all the information on how to, to send your contributions and install any contribution you have come. So I will give now the floor to Chiara to explain you in general and uh, the main lines of, of these documents. So Chiara, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Jorge. So on the next slide, I am uh, presenting the key proposals by Berek on the DMA and the regulation of uh, digital gatekeepers. So first of all, uh, Berek strongly welcomes the ambition of the DMA to create a fair and contestable market. And uh, many of the issues and ideas which are raised by Berek during the response to the public consultation of last year on the DSA package uh, were taken on board by the European Commission. So we are, of course, very supportive of this. This being said, uh, Berek believes also that for making this ambition uh, a reality, uh, some improvements are needed uh, to ensure that the regulatory intervention is swift, uh, effective and uh, future proof. Our proposals uh, focus on uh, the objectives. Uh, so first of all, uh, we think that there is a need to strengthen the measure to reach uh, market contestability and to foster conditions for inter-platform competition. Um, now, the impression we have is that uh, um, the intervention is uh, focused on uh, enabling and making the interactions between the gatekeepers and business users fair. 
Um, but we think that there is also uh, conditions for uh, competition between uh, gatekeepers, which should be ensured. And we know that this is key for sustainable competition in the long term, as we know by experience in the, in the telecom sector. Um, and then on the objectives is also the importance of ensuring that digital environments remain open and develop as an engine of, uh, of innovation, especially considering that a direct intervention to protect end users is uh, currently missing uh, in the DMA and it's something where Barrack will uh, work on. As for the scope of the intervention of the regulation, so we have, uh, we take two positions. On the one hand, uh, we say that we have a preliminary position on the, the inclusion of NICS, of Number Independent uh, Interpersonal Communication Services, saying that uh, we call for some caution because these services are already regulated under the code, the telecom code, uh, in some circumstances. And we are carrying out uh, an, analysis, uh, an analysis to see if there are potential overlapping and interactions and how these two legal frameworks should work together. So we have um, this analysis will be uh, published before the summer. On the identification of the gatekeepers, uh, Barrack thinks that their ecosystemic nature, sh nature should be taken into account. And we see also the need uh, to set uh, uh, guidelines for the designation of, uh, of gatekeepers, clearer guidelines like we have it in the, for SMP operators, for instance. And also we think that the, uh, the regulation and the regulatory intervention on national gatekeepers should not be hindered if it is needed. Um, on the next slide, please. So these were uh, the introductionary point, uh, but Barrett thinks that the key challenges of the application of the DMA is on the enforcement, on the definition of regulatory measures and on the support by the national level. So on the enforcement, um, we believe that it is key uh, to create a regulatory framework to build sound knowledge and detailed understand understanding of the sectors. Um, we know that uh, information asymmetries in uh, newly regulated markets is, uh, um, can be very big and it needs to be reduced, needs to be addressed. So we think that there is a first step, which is the building a sound knowledge of what is happening in this, uh, in this market. And in order to do it, uh, we believe that there is a constant regulatory dialogue with all type of uh, stakeholders uh, which, uh, which needs to be built. Um, for the moment, the Commission is uh, planning to have uh, this dialogue only between uh, the Commission and the gatekeepers. And we think that uh, it is needed also to involve uh, other stakeholders like uh, business users, uh, potential competitors and also end users to understand really how and uh, if uh, the intervention which is proposed will really be effective and to make it effective. And um, we know by this by experience because when uh, we have to define uh, technical remedies, we put around the table uh, everybody. So not only uh, the SMP operators, but the alternative operators and other people we, which, who will be actually affected by these remedies and it could help, help, could help us um, giving the insights to uh, effectively design these remedies. And um, another uh, key point, which is uh, currently missing in the DMA, uh, is the, the need to set up uh, a dispute resolution mechanisms. We do it in uh, regulated markets, in the telecom markets we do it, and we know that it's uh, very relevant to address, quickly address issues with the business users uh, and uh, between the business users and users and the gatekeepers in this case. And uh, this is also an additional way to reduce the information asymmetry that, uh, that I was mentioning before. So it's very key also to uh, collect relevant information on, on the markets and on what is happening. On the regulatory measures, uh, we believe that the list of obligations, which is now in the, in the DMA, should be clarified, uh, clarified uh, in order also to ensure uh, regulatory certainty. Uh, so we would suggest to have a, a list of directly applicable obligations for all CPS. And then another one for uh, all gatekeepers within the same CPS. Sometimes, we, because some uh, obligations they need, they have to be specified according to um, a CPS. They need to take into account the specificities of, uh, of this uh, CPS in particular. So we would propose to have uh, two different sets of uh, directly applicable obligations. And most importantly, we also think that it's uh, necessary to add um, a, a, another level of intervention. And we believe that the EU regulators should also have the, the mandate to tailor remedies on a case-by-case -case basis. 
basis. So it's uh, something which should uh, particularly be relevant for highly technical measures, uh, which need to be uh, defined, uh, carefully designed, and also uh, to be proportionate because uh, they are more intrusive than other uh, uh, type of interventions. And this is something which has already been done, uh, successfully done in the, uh, for two decades in the telecom sector. So it's not something new. And this kind of intervention is, uh, is uh, regulatory. Uh, it's certain, um, it is proportionate, and it's something that uh, there is already relevant experience on. So we can get, uh, so the commission can get inspiration for, uh, from this experience. And finally, the last point is about the national level. Uh, we think that national independent authorities have uh, developed a very useful expertise on uh, monitoring of markets, the monitoring of compliance, uh, regulatory enforcement, dispute resolution, uh, remedy designs, and uh, the EU regulators could and should rely on this experience, which is already existing. And uh, we do not take a stance on uh, which uh, um, independent authorities uh, should be uh, to, to support the European uh, regulator. Uh, it is up to the member states to decide, but we just say there is relevant national expertise which uh, uh, can and should be used. Um, and as we know, in BEREC, uh, there is a national level, but there is also the need for an harmonization at the uh, European level. And uh, that's why we propose to create an um, uh, advisory board, uh, which uh, would harmonize this support coming from national uh, authorities. So these are the key proposals by BEREC, and uh, to test, uh, reinforce, and uh, share these proposals, we plan to organize uh, two uh, workshops with EU institutions and, and uh, stakeholders, and Jorge will uh, We'll give you a, an overview of these uh, two workshops. Thank you, Kiara. So, if we can move, yes. So, as part of that dialogue, we want to maintain along this year to better help institutions for the final to the final final configuration of the of the DMA. We are to organize in the short term a couple of uh, public uh, workshops. Uh, the, the first one is about market entry, that it's an issue that for Berek, I mean, we, we have in, in the telco markets, uh, we have in, been encouraging that market entry at the same remedies is of a special interest for us. So we, will, uh, we are confirming speakers it will be on 16th of April. You will see the information in the Berek website. And the idea is to hear for, from that uh, potential competitors and, and, and challengers uh, for gatekeepers, the, the issues they see on, on, on market entry. Uh, so we will come with the participation of, of the European Parliament. We have already confirmed Carlos Torriño to be participating in the Commission. And the second one that is now being configured is about end users' uh, concerns and interests. That is an issue that we want uh, to explore on this. Uh, you will also see the information in the website at the moment we will finish the, the configuration. And it will also be organized in this case within COP, uh, probably. And that's all from our side. So I give the floor to, to Michel. Thank you very much, Jorge. Thank you very much to, to all uh, speakers, Julia, Begonia, and Chiara uh, as well. So uh, as uh, mentioned uh, earlier, we will start with uh, the, the questions we, we received during the last uh, few days. And uh, the first one is, from uh, Marian Fernandez uh, about our preliminary views on the roaming regulation, but this is something I've already addressed in my um, introduction. Then I have a, a second question, and I hope I, I pronounced the name correctly, from Giozzo uh, De Brezzini uh, from a governmental IT development agency. And this is a question for uh, Julia and Begonia. When are you planning to start the geographical survey of network deployments? Uh, Begonia and Julia, you have the floor. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Berek is not uh, starting the geographical surveys. Berek is providing guidelines so that nominated uh, 
authorities in each member state carry out those, sur those surveys in a consistent way. So it is for authorities in each member state to carry out the, su the surveys and the code, Article 22.1, says clearly that this needs to be done by December 2023. Uh, from what we have heard from several of our colleagues, the authorities are already working on this. So we are expecting that this is happening by 2023, as the code requires. Okay, and this is all I, I can say. Thank you very much, uh, Begonia. The next question on my list comes from uh, Johan Ketelaar from Facebook, and uh, he would like um, to, to ask the following question. Could you elaborate on how Berek sees the interplay between the EEC and the DMA? So again, Jorge and Chiara, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you for the question. This is an issue where probably you have seen in, a, in both documents uh, the uh, overlapping in general should be avoided and, uh, for example, on NICS, uh, we, we are saying that it should be treated with uh, caution. And on this, we will further develop because it's clear that Berek uh, should uh, take a more detailed uh, view, etc. So it will be the first thing we will work on, not only on mix, but on general on how this overlapping and interplay between the DMA and, and the code will take place. So I think that in, in a couple of months, you will see a, a document from us and we will come uh, any input on that for the public consultation. Oh. Thank you so much, uh, Jorge. I have uh, now a question from uh, Anastasia Sendrea from uh, MVNU um, Europe. Um, the, the first two questions are related to Article 6.1e on the Draft Digital Market Act. Um, so, um, MVNU Europe would like to ask Berek to clarify why it does not make any recommendation regarding, regarding that, uh, this provision. And the second question um, in, with that respect uh, is that MVNO Europe would like to know whether Berek agrees with the idea that that provision should not only be about enabling end users to switch between and to subscribe to services, but also about enabling end users to simply access electronic communication services and uh, of any provider. And I'll come back later with a third question. So, Jorge and Chiara, uh, again, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Michel. So, on the first question, uh, why we did not take a stance on this. Uh, so, for Berek, for the uh, preliminary um, analysis that we did, it looked this article looked uh, complete to us. Uh, but we invite uh, MVNO to give us their insights in the public consultation in order to uh, to give us some uh, some insights and some arguments that uh, uh, could further uh, feed our analysis. Um, for the second questions, um, yes, uh, Berek agrees with the, with the statement, and uh, which for us does not seem to to leave any room for doubt. Um, and uh, we would like also to mention the leaked document, uh, uh, which was uh, leaked some days ago. Um, where the European Commission was clarifying this point uh, for Article 6.1e, uh, they gave an example saying that it would apply uh, in case of uh, end users who would like to switch to a different <coughs> internet access providers, but the gatekeepers has reserved certain functionalities of the hardware, so for example, uh, 4G internet connectivity, only to those providers which have partnership agreements with it. So it's, uh, it seems that uh, Article 6.1e uh, would address the, the concerns uh, which are, is raised by um, MVNO. And uh, in case, uh, again, uh, it is uh, MVNO is of the opinion that this is not enough, uh, please uh, send us your comment in the, during the public consultation because we are very uh, eager to, to take this uh, insights into account. Thank you very much, uh, Chiara. Uh, last question from MVNO uh, Europe. 
Uh, and being Europe would like to ask if Berec would consider action to ensure that end users relying on a gatekeeper's operating system can benefit from the full set of services provided by the electronic communications providers of their choice. And um, give an example of putting an end to undue restrictions at operating system level on configuration and the use of voice over LTE, voice over Wi-Fi, and the ability to use all supported mobile regenerations, including 5G. So Chiara and Jorge, once again, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, on this point, so as of today, uh, Telco NRAs and Barrack uh, have no regulatory power uh, to, to do this, to allow them to, to impose such an obligation on undertaking providing uh, operating systems. However, we are carrying out uh, um, an analysis on the internet value chain and the internet ecosystem now um, within Barrack, and uh, it is in this framework that Barrack will uh, more likely uh, deliver a first analysis on this. And uh, we are uh, to organize in this year, um, in the next month, uh, probably around uh, in uh, like in autumn, uh, workshops uh, uh, together, uh, stakeholders' uh, view on this. So um, we, in this case, like once more, we, we welcome any feedback in this uh, in this framework. Thank you very much, uh, Chiara. And now I have a, a last uh, question we received in advance from uh, Znenek Vanicek from CAAC. And um, put in a nutshell, the, the question is the following. Uh, as Berek puts an, an increasing focus on collaboration with other authorities, will it prepare to continue to do so? And this in the, in the, in the backdrop of the, uh, the DMA uh, opinion. Jorge and Chiara, once again, this is for you. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. We will not only be prepared, but eager. To, to to collaborate with them, etc. In the next months, we plan to have meetings with them, and and we also understand. I think that is well expressed that this is an issue covering many different topics, as for example uh, data protection, etc. And, and, and there is an interrelation among all of them. So, for for addressing issues for digital platforms. Um, it's key, the collaboration among uh, different uh, authorities. In fact, you, you can see that we have said, talk about NIAS, national independent authorities, that it's not only the, 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 the telco uh, authorities, because we, we understand that this is crossing several. Uh, so we are eager uh, to that. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge. So uh, I come now to the first uh, question uh, dropped in the chat function, and I have a question from Aldo uh, Artigiani from Huawei, um, who wants to know what are Barrick's plan to ensure a, a timely transition to IPv6 in the EU? So indeed, uh, I will answer this question myself. Uh, during the, the plenary meeting, we adopted an, an internal uh, report on a preliminary assessment on the transition to IPv6 in uh, Europe. And uh, the purpose of this uh, report is to assess the yes, situation in, in Europe with uh, respect to the transition to IPv6 and to propose next steps to uh, barracks regarding the, that uh, topic. So input to the report including, uh, includes NRA responses to uh, an internal questionnaire, stakeholder presentations, and input to a virtual net uh, workshop, sorry. Uh, NRA's presentation and input uh, to the same workshop and uh, a broad and open discussion about what next step barracks should take. So regarding action that Berek can take going forward about IPv6 uh, adoption, the report notes a number of proposals, for example, raising awareness around uh, IPv6 adoption, possibly through a sharing of experiences and best practices. The report is not public available as further uh, discussions is needed on the next steps and this will be decided in more details uh, when developing our work program for 2022. 
The next question uh, in the chat function is once again for um, Chiara and uh, Jorge from uh, Frederick de Bakker Telefonica about the DMA. Could you give some ideas on how the regulatory dialogue would work in practice, public consultations or other mechanisms? Clara, Jorge, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for, uh, for this question, Frederic. So, first of all, uh, public consultations, of course, is something that uh, we have uh, considered and it's something which is uh, uh, being done in the, in the telecom sectors, um, especially like, for instance, like when there are um, uh, market analysis and it's uh, uh, a context in which very relevant feedbacks can be, can be gathered. So, for sure, public consultation is the first uh, concrete examples. And then in the telecom sectors, there are also uh, committees which are uh, organized or chaired by NRAs, so in which NRAs are um, participating. And this is uh, another way to uh, gather a stakeholders view, to put them uh, really around the table and uh, uh, define, for example, technical uh, um, details of uh, uh, regulatory interventions or to gather uh, feedbacks from them. Another way, so this is a more structural, let's say, and then there is also a way to have uh, to maintain a constant interactions with uh, with stakeholders and uh, um, business users, but also uh, end users. And for instance, um, Beric is supporting uh, this uh, approach, uh, data driven regulation, which means that there is a collection of information and uh, data which is uh, done both on a regular basis, uh, but also uh, like uh, kind of real time. So to put uh, in place uh, some um, uh, tools which would enable the regulators to gather uh, data, to gather complaints and so on. This is something which has been done already by some uh, NRAs and uh, something which can be in, uh, in the telecom sector and it can be can inspire also the, the organization of this regulatory dialogue in the um, in the DMA. Um, for instance, telco regulators, they uh, regularly uh, uh, gather uh, details from uh, operators in the sector. So this is something which is also a way to uh, ensure that there is this dialogue with the different stakeholders. Um, and then I uh, also mentioned before the organization of this uh, technical fora uh, with the operators. This is something which was uh, uh, typically done in the telecom sector for a uh, number portability and which was one of the reasons why this actually, which is something of course uh, technical and uh, it, I mean which has a uh, technical, economic and uh, organizational uh, components and uh, it, this was uh, one of the, the reasons why this worked in, uh, in practice. It, uh, it actually it was effective. So uh, we believe that there is a, a, a variety of different uh, tools which could be put in place um, and which could be uh, uh, could make the, the effectiveness of the, the application of the regulation uh, uh, real. I don't know, Jorge, if you have other uh, options. Well, I think that you have explained, but, but, but of course there are many different mechanisms. What is important is to stretch that the dialogue because um, the proposal of course it's it's not forbidden and uh, the commission can go at any place to to other stakeholders etc but, but it's important to structure it and, and to ensure that everybody that is affected by the regulation have a, a say and, 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 and can raise their their views and, and opinions that so. Many thanks uh, Jorge and Chiara and um, I'd like to thank uh, all the participants for the, the questions they, they, they asked and also the speaker for the, the, the answer they provided. I hope this, this clarifies Beric's views and way, way forward and let's now pass to our uh, second set of uh, presentation. We will start with the uh, BCRD uh, opinion so Wilhelm, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, Michel. The title of the presentation is Beric Opinion on the Revision of the Broadband Cost Reduction Directive, BCRD. The European Commission asked Beric to provide an opinion on the revision of the BCRD at the end of October last year. The Beric Opinion answers the 40 questions structured in 10 sections of the European Commission's questionnaire. General questions. Access to existing physical infrastructure and coordination of civil works, the objectives of the BCRD, 
are important to reduce the cost and increase the speed of deploying high-speed electronic communications networks, ECN. The main problems are VCN operators depend on the physical infrastructure of other operators and the physical infrastructure providers, the operators of other sectors and VCN operators typically do not have an interest to share their physical infrastructure. Dispute settlement body. The principle of the dispute settlement process is very positive. It ensures the enforceability of the obligations set out in the BCD, which supports ECN operators to reduce the cost and increase the speed of deploying ECN. Measures are important, which make the outcome of the deep settlement procedure more foreseeable for ECN operators, for example, guidelines at national level. Very considers the is best placed to perform the functions of the national dispute settlement body. Next slide, please. Single information point. Barrick's overall evaluation of the functioning of the single information point is positive. The single information point facilitates the use of existing physical infrastructure and coordination of civil works. It's appropriate that public sector parties and also other organizations, for example, network operators, make information on existing physical infrastructure available via the single information point. Barrick considers the area is also best placed to perform the functions of the national single information point, at least the areas which already perform these functions. Access to existing physical infrastructure. Expanding the access obligations from network operators to other organizations, for example, public administrations or owner of physical infrastructures has advantages in terms of effectiveness of the PCRD. On the other hand, this will likely increase the number of disputes and therefore the effort for the dispute settlement body, which would need attention. There is no need for further guidance on costing methodology in the revised PCRD. This would even risk to overrule the guidelines for cost sharing pricing principles already issued by the dispute settlement body at national level based on national experiences. There is also no need for more specific rules on the grounds for the refusal to access in the revised PCRT. The reason is a directive defines rather general principles and the reasons for refusal to access are already well developed in the current PCRT. Next slide, please. Coordination of civil works. There is potential to leverage coordination of civil works. The most promising measures are the availability of information on planned civil works in due time before the civil works begin, and planning security for the undertakings, in particular with regard to the cost allocation mechanism. There is, as in case of access to existing physical infrastructure, there is no need for further guidance on pricing in the revised PCLD. This would even risk to overrule the guidelines for cost sharing pricing principles already issued by the dispute settlement body at national level. The, prefer the preferable option is the publication of guidance at national level, uh, taking into account case by case experiences. Permit granting procedures. NOAs typically do not have the legal competence to grant permits. It's appropriate that the permit fees are set not higher than the administrative costs. It would not be appropriate to establish the single information point as a centralized permit granting authority. For example, then the information and knowledge of local authorities on the local situation would get lost. And in case the NOA performs the function of the single information point, then this would change the task of the NOA completely. Next slide, please. Access to inbuilding physical infrastructure. In one country, the number of disputes with regard to access to inbuilding physical infrastructure is particularly high. In order to reduce this high number of disputes, the NOA issued non binding guidelines and decisions for the largest ECN operators. 
A few other NOAs report positive experiences. The provision of access to physical infrastructure contributed to a great easier deployment, and it seems the parties could reach an agreement themselves. There is no need to adjust the definition of the term access point in the revised BCRD. The reason is the scope of Article 9 of the BCRD differ from the scope of Article 61, Paragraph 3 in the European Electronic Communications Code. Expanding the physical infrastructure. The suggested requirement to deploy physical infrastructure suitable for hosting very high capacity network elements along new or majorly renovated communications routes like roads and railways, transport hubs and public supply networks might facilitate the deployment of very high capacity networks. However, this should be confined to specific cases, for example, along major transport paths or in urban areas. The suggestion that new deployments of EZN shall deploy access capacities for other operators has several advantages and disadvantages. For example, this may largely decrease the average cost for providing retail services, and on the other hand, who pays the access capacities in case they are costly and not used. Next slide, please. Environmental impact of ECN. Coordination of civil works and the use of existing physical infrastructure may already reduce the environmental impact of ECN since they avoid civil works. Factors to be considered in the determination of the environmental impact of ECN operation could be the design of ECN equipment, for example, the energy efficiency, repairability, reusability, recycling, energy consumption, for example, the availability of the sleep mode, indirect consequences of ECN operation, for example, the consumption of ICT devices connected to the network, management of network's life cycle and waste collection and treatment. Thank you. Now I hand over to the next presenter, to Paolo. Thank you, William. Uh, today, I will be talking about the draft report on handling on third party payment charges. Next slide, please. Well, the report is aimed at shedding a light on a market, the market for mobile payments, which is a market which has been increasingly getting attention by part of regulators. In particular, in particular the report won't gather some knowledge on the services, in particular, understanding what are third party payment services and what is what are the inner working of the industry? What is the value chain? What are the actors which are present along the value chain? The report wants also to share experiences on the way every member state has regulated and in particular, what are the tools which are used to protect the consumers and how member states are planning to implement the new code with the regard with this kind of services and wants also to identify areas of further consumer protection. The activities started last year. Uh, and the report is mainly based on desk analysis and on the analysis of the result of a questionnaire which was developed and circulated to all members in the third quarter of 2020. After that, the questionnaires were analyzed and the report was drafted. Next slide, please. The whole report uh, revolves around two main topics, the institutional framework and the consumer protection measure. As the institutional framework is concerned, the report analyzes what are the legal definition and what is the legal base that NRAs and other competent authorities have used in order to regulate this area. What are the NRA responsibilities and on what is on which powers are based the, the collection of information by part of NRAs. And in particular, the report would also to understand how relevant is the problem in each member state on the basis, on the basis of the complaints. The second part of the report is concerned with consumer protection measures, and in particular, 
how consent has to be expressed by consumers in order to subscribe to these services. What are the information and transparency measures in in place and you know if there are any spend reminders spend treasures and alerts that consumers receive how they can unsubscribe to the services and how they can call for refunds this resulted in a 70 page report which includes a lot of information on the sector what are the key elements of the report well in addition to the relevant level of information and quantitative data on the on this area what we derive is there's a higher level of protection with regard to premium rate services uh, that the one which is in place for direct cargo billing services the the report also proposed the inclusion in the 2023 work program of the same exercise in order to be able to compare the regulation which is in place today with the regulation that will be in place after the national transposition of the report. The public consultation was launched yesterday and will end on the 16th of April of 2021. And that's all for me. And at this point, I will leave the stage to Anne-Marie on the work program 2022. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, on my, from my side as incoming chair, I have used uh, the opportunity at the plenary one to present the structure of the timeline of the um, work program and as um, uh, from today we have started um, that I'm sorry as you may have known the uh, may have noticed the publication of our first outline of the work program was published uh, at the end of January of this year and it consists of uh, most of the regular obligations that we have that stem from either the work program by the European Commission and the questions that they have asked us or that are embedded in the code, as well as overflowing work from the work program of this year that we already uh, can emphasize. Uh, today, we are starting our call for input uh, from all our stakeholders. Um, and that is a call that I will rep uh, repeat at the stakeholder forum, which is uh, will be held on the 1st of April. We will come back to that in a few minutes. Um, deadline for that input is uh, in a month on the 19th of April. So I hope to receive all your suggestions for further inputs on our work program 2022 by um, uh, the 19th of next month. So that gives you a week of a week, uh, five weeks from now. When we have received all that input, um, it is up to the incoming chairs team to see how we can uh, make a viable program from that with the proper priorities as well as the proper workload. Um, and that will be discussed within BAREC and we will have to, we will adopt that draft working program um, for consultation at the end of September. So over the summer, we will construe a program which we will uh, present at the plenary in September and then we'll um, publish for the consultation for your views at the end of September and then taking into account all your views and reactions we plan to have a final working program adopted in December of this year which would be uh, quite in time to prepare us all for the work that we are going to undertake in 2022. So that is our schedule, which is presented here. Um, and then on the next slide, um, uh, the stakeholder forum, which is always a very important step, a milestone within the preparations for the work program of the coming year. Um, we have put together a program that already reveals, I think, some of the uh, ongoing priorities that we will um, put forward I think in line with the priorities uh, uh, 
uh, this year. That is the first is uh, the work on the very high capacity networks and uh, more specifically on 5G, where we will talk, uh, we'll have a presentation on the relation between the 5G on the one hand and the UN development goals on the other, um, as well as um, a presentation by Dan Schöblom on the work that Barracks have Barrack has done so far and is going to undertake to make sure that we all that we from Barrack also contribute to the important importance of 5G of increasing connectivity for the people of Europe. Then Rita Weisenbeek will join us to present the European Commission program on the digital decade. And Michel, as present chair, will um, zoom in on the importance of end users in the light of Article 123. Um, and then finally, uh, also taking forward, um, I will repeat, as I said, my call for input for the work program 2022. And I have asked um, the, the co-chairs of the working group on sustainability to also present the work that they have been doing so far, which will also very much feed into our program for 2022. So I think that all is um, set in place for a really fascinating program on the 1st of April, that is uh, within two weeks. The only thing I hope is that you will all be, be present there as well um, and that you will register in time. And I think that um, this is a kind of a commercial and um, I do think that we actually have a commercial break at present. I will ask the office to start the video, please. sure it will be present at the website of Beric where you can all have another look. Please remember, uh, register for this participation in the stakeholder forum the afternoon of the 1st of April. Thank you. Michel, back to you. Thank you uh, very much, Anna-Marie. The video will be for the next time, I guess. Uh, thank, thank you to uh, Wilhelm and to Paolo too for the uh, excellent presentation. Sanu. We have uh, come to uh, this, the second Q&A uh, session. We, 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 rec we received some, some questions in advance and I will start with uh, the, the very first one. Um, and this is for uh, Wilhelm. So, um, the next furniture from CAEC asked um, the, the following question regarding BCRD. So the Commission will publish a review of this uh, directive and that some lighten the burden to op uh, of operators to roll out infrastructures. How does BEREC intend to contribute to this important initiative? Willem, the floor is yours. Thank you. As already presented before, the European Commission asked BEREC for an opinion on the revision of the PCAT. And this opinion was presented some minutes before and has been approved by the Board of Regulators last week and will now be submitted to the European Commission. And at the plenary meeting last week, the Commission also thanked Beric for his input and informed us that they will, of course, take into account this opinion from Beric when on their, in their further work on the revision of the PCRT. In addition, Beric participated in a workshop of the European Commission on the evaluation and review of the PCRT on 22nd of February this year, where input was provided based on the draft Beric opinion. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Willem. Um, the same person asked uh, an, another uh, another question related to BCRD as well. One of the main problems seems indeed to be that operators in CN and non-NCN have no interest to make their existing physical infrastructure in available to ECN operators or to coordinate civil work with them. Would strengthening of the broadband cost reduction directive, for instance, through a regulation helped at all? Uh, Willem, the floor is yours. 
Yes. Thank you for this question. The objective of the BCD is to reduce the cost and increase the speed of deploying high speed electronic communications networks. And therefore, the BCD imposed the possibility to uh, foresees the possibility to impose obligations on network operators, on both of non-ECN operators and both of ECN operators, in order to make a physical infrastructure which already exists available for ECN operators so that they can roll out high-speed ECN networks at lower cost. Therefore, this is a main principle of the DCD, but of course, as mentioned before in the presentation, this uh, that would necessarily mean that the other operators have interest to share the physical infrastructure. So this is seen as a main point uh, in the concept of the PCD. But as mentioned before, Berwick considers it important to reduce the cost and increase the speed with uh, the concept of use of existing physical infrastructure of other operators. Thank you, uh, Wilhelm. Now that we are uh, with the BCRD, I have another question from you for you uh, from Eric Masarczyk. I, I hope I pronounce the name correctly from Deutsche Glasfaber Holding, and uh, this this is uh, related to the coordination. And um, there is a fear that possibly one company has to wait for another to go forward for deployment of the infrastructure. This could mean that possibly resources for civil engineering cannot be used in time since the one company has to wait to be ready for the other one. How do you think that is a, a, about a problem? Uh, Wilhelm, the, the floor is yours. Thank you for this question. Currently, this is not foreseen. The impact on the operator who uh, has already announced that he may out carry out civil works needs to be taken into account and there is no need to wait for other operators to join. And this is also not what Beric has suggested in the opinion. However, as mentioned in the presentation before, it's useful that if an operator rolls out uh, infrastructure and plans civil works, that this is informed to the public as soon as possible, so that other operators have a real chance to consider to share this uh, civil work and also lay down physical infrastructure in this uh, look at this location or route. So this was the main proposal from Beric that the information is made as soon as possible, but not stated that the other operators shall wait. Thank you very much, Wilhelm. And I've got a last question for you from Gonzalo Garcia from Telefonica on BCRD once again regarding the, the, the interplay with the regulations. So um, regarding infrastructure already uh, under ex ante obligation from SMP uh, operators like uh, Dex and Paul, wouldn't the BCRD imply an overlap of the regulatory regime already in place and accordingly, instead of being a streamlined and more flexible regime, it might be understood as an additional burden on top of traditional regulations and shouldn't BCRD aimed to complement current SMP regime. Willem, once again, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, this topic has been considered in the direct opinion the relation between the BCRD and the SCP regulation. And it needs to be noted that there are several significant differences between both. The first is the objective and the scope. The objective of the BCRD is to reduce the costs of rollout of this high-speed ECN. The objective of the BCRD is not to ensure competition in specific markets in the electronic communication sectors, which on the other hand is the focus of the SCP regulation. So the, the objective differs significantly. The second point is also the operators concerned. The BCNT, as mentioned before, foresees the possibility to put an obligation access to existing infrastructure to all operators, not only ECN operators, but also the operators of other sectors, for example, electricity, gas, water, etc. 
So this mean PCD enables access to physical infrastructure of many, many operators of different sectors. In case of SMB regulation, this is not the case. The SMB regulation is only related to one operator, well, typically one or a few operators, the operator or operators which have significant market power. And the third point, which is also significant different, is the time of the measure imposed. In case of PCD, there is no limit with regard to time. The PCA operator gets access to the physical infrastructure without any limit. And in case of SCP regulation, this is usually uh, uh, this is usually foreseen until the beginning of the next market analysis procedures, when the obligations are will be reviewed. So there are differences. Um, and most important, the different objectives. So it's not possible to leave one out because there are two different objectives which are important and need to be pursued. On the one hand, to ensure competition, SP regulation, and on the other hand, increase the possibilities to reduce the cost and increase the speed of applying high speed ECN. Thank you very much, uh, Wilhelm. Um, I have a, a, another question from uh, Sidney Vanitzer from CAEC uh, regarding uh, the state of play um, for the um, transposition of the EEC into national um, law. And uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, with, the, with the pandemic, um, as you know, um, the, the COVID has been considered as influencing the, the priorities of the member states and uh, has also demonstrated that connectivity has never been much uh, important in, in, our, in our lives. But so, um, having said that, Beric is um, obviously in favour of a consistent uh, transposition of, of the code across the, the European uh, Union, but uh, Beric has little influence on, on this process, this is a prerogative for uh, the all member states, and uh, our main role, as I uh, mentioned in, in the introduction, is to ensuring the harmonised implementation of, of the code, and it will we we have done that through the development of uh, guidelines. Um, so these guidelines will have a substantial uh, impact on the way those those rules will be implemented, but not uh, on directly. On, on, on the timing uh, of the um, uh, transposition. And as, as we know, uh, very few member states have transposed the, uh, this code uh, timely. I have a, a, a last set of questions in the chat from uh, Luke uh, Indrix from uh, ECTA uh, regarding um, uh, spectrum issues. So the first one uh, being um, um, the RSPG, uh, which is currently consulting on, on three documents, that's that's correct. And the question is, will Beric uh, answer to this question? So, because we have no mandate for this, we will, we will not uh, uh, answer to this um, question. But could Beric provide an update on the main takeaways from the, the peer reviews for no, no for the time being, and there is no peer review uh, ongoing, so I, I'm afraid it's a little too soon for uh, for that. And last question is very discussing uh, the the auction in in different uh, countries. So not for the time being, as I uh, mentioned. Uh, sorry, there is uh, one more question. Is Beric looking at the current uh, open RAN uh, discussion? So we're interested in in any um, develop technical technological development of networks, uh, of course. But we have no uh, deliverable for for that this uh, this year. We are uh, cooperating with uh, the NIS Cooperation uh, Group on on uh, 5G security. But for the time being, no uh, deliverable uh, foreseen. Maybe uh, later on can be a suggestion for. Uh, next year. So, uh, with that, I think that I uh, will just have a last check. We have no uh, further uh, question. So, I would like to to thank you all for uh, being with us today, and um, I would like to to thank the, the co-chairs uh, very much for the presentation, the Berec office for accommodating this e this event. But I would like to to thank. Uh, my colleague uh, Anne Marie uh, as well. So uh, please pencil uh, in, in your diary the, the next uh, stakeholder uh, forum 
uh, this is uh, on the, the 1st of, of uh, April. And uh, the, the next public debrief as well will be on the uh, 16th of June. With that, I thank you very much and I wish you a very good afternoon and I hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.